So we ended the last session talking about segment trees. And today we're going to continue talking about segment trees. So remember, our input is an array A that has n integers. And we have two operations. We can add some value x to some particular i of the array. So add i x just gives us i n x. And we have to increase a i by x. And then we have uh, a range query or a sum query, basically, which gives us two indices i and j. And in answer to this query, we have to output the sum of all the values from index i to index j. Now, uh, we talked about the algorithms for doing this last time. Let me just show you an example of a segment tree here. So let's say my indices are from 0 to 15. I would just create a tree where the root of the tree corresponds to all of the indices. And then for every node, I have an associated segment and the segment associated to the left, the left half of this segment and the segment of the right child is the right half of this segment. And I just continue doing this until I get to my leaves here, which correspond to only one index of my array. Okay. And Today, we're going to start by coding this, and then we're going to extend it a little bit. So let's do this. Okay. So here's the thing. Let's say that first I read some number n. And I just want to create a segment tree uh, from 0 to n minus 1 or from 1 to n. It's really your choice how you want to index it. And initially, I'm just going to assume that all of my numbers are 0. So let's assume that my array is initialized with zeros. So I'm just going to have, let's say, node. And a node is basically one node of my segment tree. I could also call it segment tree node. Now, what do I have to save in every node of my segment tree? I basically need a pointer to the left child, a pointer to the right child, but also I need to save the segments that corresponds to this node, right? So I have a beginning and an end. So I have beginning and an end, and then I have the left child and the right child. Now, I want to create my segment tree. So let's say I just say my root is make tree from index zero to index n minus one. And here's how I write my make tree. It returns a pointer to the root of the tree. And let's say it's from index A to index B. Now, what should I do? I should first create a node. So let's say this is the root. And then I say its beginning is A, its end is B. And of course, at the end, I want to return it. But now I want to also create its left and right children. Okay. So I can just do this recursively, right? So I can say roots left becomes make tree from A to the index between A and B to the midpoint. So from A to A plus B over two, I'm assuming my N is small so that like I don't get any kind of overflow here. And then my right child is going to be make tree from this midpoint. Actually, let me just define the midpoint A plus B over two. So this is up until mid. And then my right child is from mid plus one to B. Okay, very easy. And so this is all I needed to create my segment tree. Of course, you can also create it in any other way you like. Now, additionally, I wanted to say that at every node of my segment tree, I keep track of the sum of all the numbers that appear in the corresponding segment. Right, so let me say that I also have a sum here. And again, I'm using int. I'm just assuming my numbers are small enough so that they will not overflow. Of course, you can use other data types. 
Now, I want to write these two operations, adding x to index i and returning the sum for all indices from i to j. Okay, so I'm just going to say, let's say I have a string o and I say as long as I can read o, if the operation is add, just read i and x and do add i x. I will write this later. Otherwise, read i and j and write the sum from index i to index j. Okay. Now, of course, I want to do this in my tree, so I wouldn't just say add and so on. I would say do it in the root. So I'm going to add some functions here called add and sum. So what does the function add do? Well, it takes some index i and it takes some value x. The idea is that I want to increase index i by x. Oh, by the way, sorry, I always forget the base cases. So here I have to say that uh, I divide it only if A is not equal to B, right? If A is equal to B, I'm already at a leaf. I don't need to keep dividing. Okay, so I want to add X units to the item at index I. Well, I can first just check, is i between beginning and end? If it's not, I just ignore it, okay? So if i is less than my beginning point or i is greater than my end point, I just return, I don't do anything. Otherwise, this index i is in the segment that corresponds to the current node. So I have to increase the sum by x, right? And then I just call the same thing on both of my children. So I just say left add i and right add i, I x. Sorry. But of course, I should do this only if left and right actually exist. So be careful about these things. If left is not null, left add i x. If right is not null, right add x. Okay. So this is my add, and as we've seen before, I'm just walking down the tree, and so this is going to take O log n time. The more interesting one is the sum. So let's say I want to find the sum. Let's call it something else. Let's call it query. So I want to query from index i to index j. What is the sum of all the numbers from index i to index j that are also from index begin to end. So what's this going to return is not just the sum of all the items from index i to j, but items from index i to j that correspond to the segment in the current node, okay? Uh, or in other words, I have two different segments, i, j, and beginning end. I'm taking the intersection of these two segments and finding the sum of all the items in those indices. Okay, first of all, of course, I want to take the intersection so I say that uh, this i, if it's less than my beginning point, I can just increase my i, right? So i becomes maximum of i and my beginning point. And similarly, j becomes the minimum of j and my end point. And I would already check here, if j is less than i, then I should return zero because I'm just looking at an empty set and the sum of numbers in an empty set is zero, okay? Otherwise, I just check, is the segment I'm looking for exactly the segment that corresponds to the current node or not? So if i is equal to begin and j is equal to end, then I already know the answer, it's just sum, okay? Otherwise, I would just ask my left child and my right child. So I say my answer is zero. If my left child is not no, answer increases by left query ij. 
if my right child is not null. I actually don't need two different checks because it's uh, either I have both of them or I don't have any of them, but it doesn't really matter. So this increases by right query. Okay, so this is our query as we've seen before. Let me see, do I have a bug now or would it work? Hmm. I forgot to say that this is an int and I need to return it, yes. I always have stupid small bugs. Okay. So let's say, whatever, my n is 16. And let's say I want to add five, uh, add seven to index five. And then I want to ask for the sum from index one to six, that's seven. I want to add, let's say, uh, to index 12, I want to add minus one. Now I ask for the sum from 10 to 12, that's minus one. I ask for the sum from five to 12, that's six. Hopefully the rest of it is correct. Okay, so now we want to analyze our runtime. And of course the runtime of add was easy to analyze. It's all again, because I'm starting at the top of the tree and I'm just going down. So it's pretty much like search in a binary search tree, it's all again. But sum was the part that is actually more interesting. So let me just copy my example here. Let's say that I want to do sum from uh, index three to index 12 here. So if I want the sum from three to 12, how am I actually breaking down this query? So I'm starting at the top and I'm saying, I want the sum from three to 12, but here I only have the sum from zero to 15. So I will just ask both of my children. So I go here, I say, I want the sum from three to 12, but my endpoint is seven. So I just want the sum from three to seven here. And again, I don't know the sum from three to seven. I know the sum from zero to seven. So I'll just break it down. I ask my left child, what is the sum from three to three? And I ask my right child, what is the sum from four to seven? Okay, now in this case, I get lucky. I already know that sum, so I don't have to go down my tree. I would already return whatever I had here. In this case, I have to still go down the tree. So I, I want the sum from three to three. I first ask here, what is the sum from three to three, but they don't intersect. So from this point, I just return zero. Then I go here, I ask for the sum from three to three. And again, I go here, I ask for sum from three to three, but it doesn't intersect. So this one returns zero. And I ask for the sum from three to three here, and I already have it. So this one returns. So I'm just putting a check mark on all the vertices that I visited, right? But this is just for the sum from three to seven, but I wanted the sum from three to 12. So I have to also ask on this side, what is the sum from eight to 12? So I've seen this vertex now. Now, because I want the sum from eight to 12, I have to ask both sides. So on this side, I ask for the sum from eight to 11. I see this. On this side, I ask for sum from 12 to 12. And then I have to also see this one, but it's empty. And then I ask for 12 to 12 here. So I see this. Again, I see this and I see this. I return the answer from here. So if you look at it like this, it seems like it's a terrible algorithm. And I might see a ton of different nodes here, right? So basically, again, if I just look at the pseudocode of my algorithm, it seems that when I want to find the sum of some segment in some node n, in the worst case, I'm calling sum on both the left child and the right child of n. So it seems like I might visit all of my nodes. And this is exactly what's happening here, right? In the worst case, I'm calling query on both the left child and the right child. But actually we're going to prove that this is not going to happen. Now to prove this, I'm going to ask you for a very special case. 
suppose that I want to find the sum for some particular preference. So instead of saying that I want the sum from i to j, as it was here, let's say that I guarantee you that i is always zero. So I just want the sum from zero to j. Okay, what happens in this case? So for example, let's say instead of the sum from three to 12, I asked you for the sum from zero to 12. Now, at the beginning, actually, let me just copy this one more time. Okay, so let's say I want the sum from zero to 12. Of course, I'm going to see my root. But now I'm going to divide my segment in two parts, as the left side and the right side. But what is my left side? What am I going to ask here? I'm definitely going to ask for zero to seven, right? Because my starting point was always zero. So I know that when I'm asking my left child, I'm getting the answer immediately. I'm not going to go further down, right? What happens on the right child? Well. Here, I had 0 to 12. So now here, I'm looking for the sum from 8 to 12. But again, very importantly, this is a prefix if you look at the segment that corresponds to this vertex, because that segment starts from 8. So it's a prefix. And I want the sum from 8 to 12. Again, I break it in two parts. But on the left hand, I'm sure that because it was a prefix here, it covers all of the left hand part. So I know the answer here. So this one will not continue to recurse. And then on the right hand, I will ask for the sum from 12 to 12. Now, in this case, again, the same thing happens. I go to the left side, and the intersection with the right side is just empty. So this time, the right side is not going to continue to recurse. Right. So this one is going to immediately end, and then I'm going here. Again, I have 12 to 12, so the right side is not going to recurse because uh, I have no intersection, and the left side is not going to recurse because I already have the answer there, okay? So basically, the idea is that if the sum I'm looking for is the sum of a prefix, my answer will come out in O log n, right? Because every time I'm breaking it down into two smaller segments, but at least one of those two segments is immediately returning the answer and not continuing to reverse. Okay, so I'm just walking down my tree. I'm basically seeing at most two times log n different vertices, but it's all log n, right? Now I can say the same thing if the segment I was asking, I was querying was a suffix because it's just the mirror image of this argument, okay? So for prefixes and for suffixes, I know that I can find my answer in O log n. Now, given that we're doing sum, instead of doing the sum from i to j, I can just do the sum from 0 to j and subtract the sum from 0 to i minus 1. right? And this is two prefixes. I know that each prefix is in O log n, so it will be overall O log n. But the whole point of using a segment tree was that I wanted to also work for operations that are not reversible. So let's say I'm doing min or max or something like that, right? In that case, I have to definitely just use the algorithm that I had here, which doesn't depend on any inverses. But I claim that even this algorithm works in all log n. Now, why is that? So here's, again, this example. Let's say I was querying the segment from 3 to 12. This is not a prefix, and it's also not a suffix, right? Now, what are the cases that can happen? This segment that I'm querying, if it's entirely on the left side, if it's entirely a subset of the segment of my left child, then my right child will immediately terminate. The same thing if it's entirely a subset of the right child. The only interesting case is when this segment intersects both the segment of my left child and the segment of my right child. So this is actually an interesting case because 312 intersects both 0, 07 and 815. Okay. But let's see what happens. It intersects both of them. So I'm going to ask for 
part of it from the left child. I'm going to ask three, seven from the left child. And then I'm going to ask for another part of it from the right child. Eight, 12 is asked from the right child. But the part that I'm asking from the left child is now a suffix. If you only look at the tree that corresponds to the left child, because this is a tree that ends at seven. The part that is asked from the right child is a prefix, right? So as soon as I break it down into two parts, one of them is a prefix, one of them is a suffix, both of them are going to end in O log n time. My total runtime is O log n. Okay. Again, now this one is like four times log n maybe at most, but it's O log n. That's the important part. Okay. So my sum is O log n, my addition is also O log n. But now I want you to just look at the intuition here. The intuition is that I have all of these indices from zero to 15. So let me just copy my indices. And I'm basically looking as, at a bunch of segments, but what are these segments? The segments were chosen so that I can write any query segment as a sum of O log N of these segments that I have pre-computed the sums for, right? So my segments were basically the segments of size one. These are some of my segments, like, oh, this is hard to draw. I should have done it with eight, okay. And then I have segments of size two. Then I have segments of size four. <coughs> then I have segments of size eight. And finally, I have a segment of size 16. And for each one of these segments, I'm basically saving the total number. And the idea is that, well, if you give me any other segment, I can basically break it down into O log n of these segments. And that's what my sum is doing. Okay. Now, let's say that I want to make my problem a little bit more interesting. So this is my current problem. My input is just an array and I have two operations. I can add or I can sum. And again, we talked about this instead of sum, I can have other operations too. But let's say it copied everything except the F. Okay. So let's say that I change my addition and I do something like this. I say add i, j, x. And what I mean here is that I want to add x to every element from index i to index j. So instead of just changing one of my elements, I want to change all the elements in the range from i to j, and I want to add x to each one of them. Okay, so instead of saying that a i increases by x, I say for every k in the range from i to j, a k should increase by x. Now, again, of course, I'm not doing to, I'm not going to do it just by a for loop because that would give me a runtime of O n. And I don't want to do that. I mean, n log n if I use the previous approach in a for loop. So I would ideally like to still have O log n runtime for both of them. For both add and sum. Now, the good point is that I can still use the same intuition as here. I can say that whatever segment I have, I can break it down into O log n of these segments. Let's call this, I don't know, the canonical segments, the segments that I already have stuff for. So, I don't really have to change my sum, right? So if I just have the sum at each one of the nodes of my segment tree, I can still answer some queries just like before. What I have to change is how I'm doing my addition. So again, look at this and imagine that I'm adding one to every element from index three to index 12. Okay. Now the problem here 
is that I have to continue going down the tree. So I want to add to every element from index three to 12. I say, okay, go to the left and add to every element from index three to seven. Then I say, go here to the right and add to every element from index four to index seven. But previously I could just stop here. Now I have to still go down. I have to cover all the other vertices, right? Because if I'm adding something to all the vertices from index four to index seven, I'm also adding some, that thing to all the vertices from index four to five, and also all the vertices from index six to seven, and then I have to do these as well. So this is not a great idea. Instead, we're going to just be lazy, and it's literally what they call it. They call it a lazy segment tree. Now, how are we going to be lazy? Well, we're just going to change what we save at each node of our segment tree. Okay, so this is the idea. Be lazy. Now, every node, let's call it N, is going to keep two things now. Now, previously, it used to just keep the sum of all the numbers from its beginning index to its end index. So I'm going to say, keep the same thing. So sum of all the items in the range from the beginning index, so end at beginning to the end index. I'm going to keep the same thing now, but I'm also going to add something else and I call this lazy. And this is basically a number that had to be added to every number in the range from I to J, but I didn't do it because I was lazy. Okay. So this had to be added to everything. in range i, basically, sorry, begin to end range. But I'm saying this is something that had to be added, but I actually didn't do it, okay? Now you'll see what I mean when I show you the code. So I'm going to have the sum here and I'm going to have something called lazy and this lazy value is, again, something that had to be added to the sum, but I didn't add it. So now I'm going to write my add. So let's call this one add one. I'm going to add a new add function, which takes i and j and x. And actually, let me do my queries here. Oh, sorry, my main function here similarly. So I read i, j, and x. And then I add ijx. Okay. Just like sum, the first thing I have to do is to make sure that uh, the segment ij is a subset of the segment corresponding to the current node. So I first say i becomes the maximum of i and begin, j becomes minimum of j and end. And I again say that if j is less than i, just return. Okay, so this is pretty much like what I was doing with the query. Now I know that I have to add x to everything from index i to index j. Now I say if this segment to which I should add x is exactly equal to the segment that corresponds to this node. So if i is begin and j is end. Now I can update the sum, but if I update the sum, I have to go to the children and update their sum as well. So instead, I'm just going to say I'm lazy and I'm just going to say, increase this lazy value by X, okay? And remember, when I increase the lazy value by X, I mean that everything from index I to index J has to be increased by X, but I haven't actually done it in my tree, okay? Now, otherwise, if this is not the case, just break it down into a, a left side and a right side. 
Okay. Now, how do I break it down into the left side and right side? I say, if, uh, well, I'm just going to say, uh, yeah. If the left side exists, if left is not known, add to the left. So add left, add ij, x. And if right is not null, right add ijx. Okay. But I also have to update the sum at the current node, right? Because everything from index i to index j has increased by x, right? So the sum has to increase by j minus i plus 1 times x. The sum at the current node increases, and then I do the left hand. So basically, I'm doing exactly what I was doing for querying with one small detail, one small laziness. And it's that whenever my, uh, yeah, whenever my segments match exactly, for example, the segment corresponding to this node is 8, 11, and I'm adding to everything from index 8 to index 11. Instead of updating the sums here and at all of the children, I just update the lazy value at this node. That's the only difference. Okay. Now, let's say that I want to find the sum. So let's go back here to our query and let's see how I have to change this. So I want to find the sum of all the numbers from index i to index j. I first do this pre-processing, that's fine. Now, if i is equal to begin and j is equal to end, what should I return? So it's not just the sum, because I also have those lazy things that I didn't add, right? So it's sum plus that lazy value times the number of elements that I have, which is like j minus i plus one, okay? Otherwise, I have some particular answer initially. Now, what is my answer going to be? Well, at this note, I might have been lazy before. So first I have to add all of that laziness, which is basically, again, lazy times J minus I plus one. And then I ask my left child, what is the total sum from I to J from your point of view? And I ask my right child, what is the total sum from your point of view? I add all of these things up and I put them. Okay. Does this make sense to everyone? Why this works? Yeah, basically I'm just starting from the top of my tree and I'm going down and I'm saying, I have a bunch of sums, but I also have a bunch of lazy things that I didn't add to my sum. So when I'm doing the query, I have to keep track of both of them. Okay. And of course, you can just see that this has the exact same runtime as the one before, because the only things that I changed were this line and this line. So I cannot possibly have changed the, the runtime here. So it's still all out there. Okay. So now we've done both of these things in OLOG. But I want you to again, look at this idea here. So this is what a segment tree does. When I have a segment tree, I'm basically creating all of these uh, different segments and, and they're created like that. But we've seen other data structures, right? So we've seen, for example, prefix sums. And if I had a prefix sum, well, this is again, even more painful to draw, but I'm going to do it anyway. So if I had a prefix sum, what are the different segments that I consider in a prefix sum? Well, basically, I consider all the prefixes, right? So I consider 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 3, 0, 1, 4, and so on, right? Now, 
there is always some sort of a trade-off between how much time you need to update something and how much time you need to query. So when you want to query, you have some segments, you want to find, let's say the sum or sum operation on all of the numbers in this segment. If you want to find the sum of all the numbers in this segment, you have to somehow write your segments as a combination of the segments for which you know the answer, right? Now in a segment tree, you can write them as a combination of all log n different segments. But in a prefix sum, you can just write it as a combination of two segments, right? If you wanted the sum from i to j, that's just the sum from zero to j minus the sum from zero to i minus one. But the trade-off is when you want to update. When I want to update one particular point, for example, I want to update 10 here, I have to only update the values for segments that include 10. And in a segment tree, there are all log n of those, right? But in a prefix sum, if I update, for example, zero, I have to update all of these values, right? So an update in prefix sum actually takes O n. Now, of course, we've also seen this idea of breaking it down into chunks, right? So if I have chunks of a particular size, and we saw that actually the best uh, chunk size is just square root n, but let me just do chunks of size five here. If I had chunks of size five, basically the idea was this, I have these indices of my array again, and the segments that I'm looking at are segments of lengths five. So zero to four, then I have five to nine, then I have 10, what am I doing? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. One, two, three, four, five. And then this last one was just. Yeah. Okay. So if I have chunks of size five, these are what I have. But additionally, of course, I also kept my original array. So I have these, and I also have these segments, the segments that cover only one index each. OK. Now, generally, let's say my chunk size is m, and my array size is n. Uh, when I want to answer a query, we've seen that I can answer it in m plus n over m, basically. Right, because I had to take a bunch of chunks and I could also take a bunch of smaller ones. Uh, but when I wanted to do an update, if you look at any node here, you see that it only appears in two of the uh, segments that I'm keeping track of. So my update is all one, right? Now, of course, if I want to do updates on segments as well, and if I had chunks instead of a segment tree, I could use the same lazy idea. So for every chunk, I could say, this is the sum, and here's some lazy value that I had to add to everything in this chunk, but I didn't, right? So you can do those kinds of things with chunks as well. Okay. Nice. Move this one. Okay, we're going to talk about one other data structure that can do similar types of queries. But before that, I want to uh, just mention something else. Um, if your operation has an inverse, then you can also subtract. So then you have to write it, uh, write your segment as a combination of segments for which you have the answer. You get to also subtract segments basically, right? But if your operation doesn't have an inverse, you, you don't get to do that. So for example, if your operation was min, you just couldn't answer it with a prefix sum, right? Uh, but you could answer it here and also here. Now, we're going to consider only operations that have inverses now. So just imagine that I'm not working with min or max or anything like that, I'm working with sums. So I can subtract a segment if I want. But I'm additionally thinking that I also have updates. So right now, if I use a prefix sum, every update takes on, which is bad. 
it's not fast enough. Uh, if I use chunks, I can do it in all square root n, like every update and query. And if I use a segment tree, I can do it in all log n. But my problem is that this segment tree is kind of hard to implement, so I want something simpler. Okay. So this is where a binary index tree comes in, or a family tree. Okay. Now, first of all, it's a tree, and people always uh, call it binary index tree or family tree. But honestly, the tree structure does not matter at all. I never think of it as a tree. You can think of it as a tree, but you don't have to. Now, what is the idea here? The idea is that I want to have these prefix sums, uh, or sorry, I want to have these uh, particular segments for which I save the sum, but I want to choose them in a nice survey. Okay, now, what do I mean by a nice survey? This actually goes back to our lecture on lowest common ancestor. So remember here, when we were doing the lowest common ancestor query, I said that if I want to go k steps up, I just try to jump up by powers of two. I just take the largest power of two that I can take and I jump up by that much. And then I keep doing the same. And this gave me log n runtime. So now imagine that my segments all have lengths that are powers of two and they kind of look like this, okay? So specifically, let's say that I want some prefix sum. Let's say I want the sum from zero to 12, okay? I first say, let's find the sum from zero to eight. Then let's find the sum from eight to 12 and let's add those two things together, okay? So generally, this is the idea. If I want to answer a query which says, what is the sum from, uh, let's say index zero to index j. I start at index zero and I take the largest power of two that I can. And I want to jump by that much. Then again, I want to jump by the largest power of two and so on until I get to index j. Now, what does this mean? This means that, well, of course, at the root of my tree, I'm just going to save my uh, item zero. So the sum of my array from index zero to zero. But then I should be able to jump by one or two or four or eight, right? Now, here I'm assuming that my largest index is 15. Of course, if it was larger, I should be able to jump by other powers of two. So I need to know the sum from index zero to index one, but I don't need to include zero itself here because I already know zero here, okay? Uh, and generally speaking, honestly, when I'm doing fan victories, I usually just assume that my indices start from one because things are easier like that. Just assume that A0 is zero and we don't care about it. Okay. So I should be able to jump by one unit or two units or four units or eight units. And for each of these, I want to know what is the sum in that jump. But then again, let's say uh, I'm at two. I can also jump by one to get to three. So I want to know that sum as well. Generally speaking, I like to look at the end point. So let's say the node corresponding to 12, it ends at 12, but uh, it corresponds to a segment whose length is the largest power of two that is a divisor of 12, okay? So let me visualize this using our example here, and you will see that it's actually very intuitive. And actually doing it as a tree makes it much less intuitive. That's why I prefer not to think of it as a tree. So let's say these are the indices, and I can think of these indices in binary, right? So I say, if an index is odd, I'm just going to assign a segment of length one to it. So I'm going to have this segment, I'm going to have this segment, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Now, if a number is even, but not a multiple of four, I'm going to give it a segment of length two, okay? 
So for example, two is even, but it's not a multiple of four. So I'm going to keep track of this segment, the segment that contains two and one. Four is a multiple of four, I don't care about it. Six is not a multiple of four, so I'm going to add this segment. Eight is a multiple of four. 10 is not a multiple of four. Uh, 12 is a multiple of four. 14 is not a multiple of four. Now I say, let's look at the multiples of four that are not a multiple of eight. I'm going to assign a segment of length four to them. So I'm going to create a segment of length four that ends at four. So this is that segment. Eight is a multiple of eight, so I don't care about it. 12 is a multiple of four, but not eight. So I'm going to have this segment. And then the same thing for eight. So let's look at multiples of eight that are not multiples of 16. I'm going to assign a segment of length eight to them. So I'm going to have this one. So these are all the segments that I'm going to keep track of. And of course, if you look at it here, you see that it's the same idea. So uh, again, zero is a special case, don't care about zero. But if you look at one, I'm going to just have the sum from one to one, which is basically this. At index two, I'm going to have the sum from one to two, which is this. At index three, I'm just going to have the sum from three to three, which is, yeah, this one. I don't know why they wrote it in this weird way. So it doesn't include two, it includes three. I copied this from Wikipedia. Okay, so at four, I'm going to have a segment of length four. And you see at four, I have a segment of length four and so on. Okay, these are all the segments that I'm going to look at. So first of all, pretty easy. The number of segments is exactly n, right? Because for any endpoint, I have exactly one segment that ends there, okay? Now, let's say I give you some particular index and I ask you what is the length of the segment at this index, right? So what is the length of the segment ending at index i? It's basically the largest power of two that is a divisor of i, okay? So this is the maximum among all values of k such that two to the power of k is a divisor of i. Oh, I just realized this notation is bad, okay. But how can I find this number? Well, I can just write i in binary and I can look at the last digit that is a one. So the rightmost one digit, right? So if I in binary is something like this, let's say zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 right? What is the largest power of two that uh, divides I? Well, it's just this, right? So I have to just keep the last one but turn all of the other ones into zeros. So this gives me the length of the segment that ends at index i. And again, you can see it in this tree here. So again, forget about zero, zero is crazy. Uh, if you look at one, the length of the segment ending at one is just one. The length of the segment ending at two is two. At four, it's four. At five, the length of the segment is one. At three, the length of the segment is one, and so on. Again, you can look at it as a tree. I don't like to look at it as a tree. I prefer to look at it like this. Okay, so now I want to do my two operations. I want to be able to do sum, and I also want to do uh, updates. So let me first do this. So let's say I want the sum from index i to index j. I'm just going to do something like prefix sum. I say that this is just the sum from zero to j minus the sum from zero to i minus one. So if I can answer the sum for prefixes, I can answer it for everything. So let's now do that. 
how can I answer the sum for a prefix? So if I want the sum from, let's say, 0 to j, how do you find this? Well, for example, here, let's say I want the sum from 0 to 13. OK. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. And again, I'm ignoring 0. 0 is just 0, let's say. So the two ways of looking at this is that I start at 0. And I just keep taking the longest step that I can. I keep going forward by the largest power of 2. So in this case, if I want the sum up to 13, I can start at 0. And I ask, what is the largest power of 2 uh, that would still not get me to 13? And that's 8. So I jump here. And then again, what is the largest power of 2 that I can take? I can take a 4 and go to 12. And then what is the largest power of 2 that I can take? I can take a 1 and go to 13. And at this point, I'm at 13. And I know the sum of all of these uh, jumps, basically. So I can just sum up all of these and get my answer. Or if I look at it here, I basically started at 0. I first took this one. So it jumped all the way to 8. And now I just need the sum from 9 to 13. So again, I take the longest possible power of 2. This gives me the sum from 9 to 12. And then again, I get the longest possible power of 2 that I can jump. And that gives me the sum to 13. Now, of course, it's kind of obvious that I'm going to use at most O log n jumps here. Because again, each one of my jumps is one of the ones in the binary representation of this number j, right? And I can have at most log n ones in the binary representation of j, so I'm going with it. OK, so this is the way that you can look at it if you want to see your data structure as a tree. But again, I said that for me, at least, it's much easier if I think of it not as a tree, but just as these segments. And for me, it's more intuitive to start at the end. So I want to find the sum from index 0 to index 13. I start at 13. And I say, OK, at 13, there is some uh, particular segment that ends at this index. OK? And wherever it starts, it's going to start after 0. So it's safe to add that segment. So I add this segment. And now I go to the beginning of the segment and I see, OK, now I need the sum up until 12. Again, I have a segment that ends at 12. So I can just take that segment and its sum into consideration. And then I go to the beginning of it, I mean, 1 before the beginning, which is 8. And again, here I say, take the segment that ends here, take this one. So you see, it's exactly the same operation. We are taking exactly the same segments. The only difference is that it's easier to find these segments if I start at the end, right? Because for every endpoint, I have exactly one segment. And I can just say the, the segment that ends at index 13, the segment that ends at index 12, the segment that ends at index 8. And I can just sum those. OK, so. I usually write the pseudocode using the second approach, but again, you can write it using the first approach. The first approach is actually what we use when we wanted to find uh, lowest common ancestor, right? So if you go back to the lowest common ancestor lecture, you will see that. But OK, if I want the sum from 0 to j, this is very simple. I just say, as my answer, I first take whatever value I had for this uh, particular place. Actually, let me just call it f. So I take f of j, and f of j, I, I use f for Fenwick, because we invented this. Uh, f of j is basically the sum of all the numbers in the indices that correspond to the segment ending at index j, right? So for example, here, f of 12 would be a9 plus a10 plus a11 plus a12. OK, so I'm going to take fj. And then I'm going to also add to this the sum from 0 to what? To j 
minus the length of this segment that ended at index j. So let me just call that lj, length of the segment that ends at index j. That's it, that's my sum function, right? And of course I need a base case. The base case is that if j is zero, the sum is zero. So you see, this is much simpler. Um, okay, let me just write it like this, return this. This is much simpler than a segment tree. Find the sums, it's just. Now let's say I want to add. And again, I'm just considering the case where I'm adding to only one element. So I'm doing add i x. You can also do the lazy idea here as well. Generally, the lazy idea works with all of these techniques. So again, this time let's actually take something else. Let's take 11. So let's say that at index 11, I want to increase the value. So let me erase these ones. So I'm doing an update here at index 11. So I have to update on the segments that include the index 11, right? What are the segments that include index 11? Well, of course, the segment that ends at index 11 is going to include it, right? But all the segments that end before 11, they don't include index 11. So I don't have to update any of those, right? So I have to at most update the segment at index 11 and maybe the segments that end after index 11. But again, the question is which ones? Now, the interesting point here is that, well, I have one segment of length one that contains 11. Do I have a segment of length two that contains 11? No, why? Because if I were to have a segment of length two that contains 11, that segment had to start at 12, right? Because segments of length two, sorry, it had to end at 12. Because segments of length two end at multiples of two, right? But 12 is also a multiple of four, so we didn't add it there. So I don't have a segment of length two that contains 11. Do I have a segment of length four that contains 11? Again, I just have to ask, what is the first multiple of four after 11? And it's 12. Is it also a multiple of eight? No. So 12 actually contains um, a segment of length four that also includes 11, right? So I can find this one, and then I can find this one, and then I can keep continuing, but I will not find any more segments, okay? As another example, let's say that I was updating five. If I'm updating five, I first ask, is there a segment of length one that contains five? If there is, it should be at the first multiple of one on or after five, which is just five, right? And because five is not a multiple of two, then I do have a segment of length one that contains five. Do I have a segment of length two that contains five? If I do have that, it should end at index six, but I would have a segment of length two at index six only if six is not a multiple of four and six is not a multiple of four. So I do have that too. Now I ask, is there a segment of size four that contains five? If there is such a segment, again, it should end at the first multiple of four that comes after five, which is eight. But eight is also a multiple of eight, so I don't have a segment of length four. And then I also have a segment of length eight, of course, and so on. So for every index, when I'm updating it, I can easily, find all the segments uh, of lengths powers of two basically that contain it. Okay, but again, I want to go to the whole binary representation thing. Okay, so let's do this for example here, I have five. Let me just write five in binary real quick. So five is four, we don't have a two, we have a one, right? This is five in now, what's happening? I have a segment of length one 
because of course the rightmost digit was one here. Now, if I ask what is the segment of length two that contains five, we said that it should be the first multiple of two that comes after five. But how can I get that? Well, I can just take this um, least significant one digit and I can add it, right? So I can take five and I add to it its least significant one digit and that gives me six basically. So I know that I have to look at six. Now, let's say I'm at six. What is six? Six is one, one, zero. Any segment that contains five and has a longer length should also contain six, right? So again, the question here is, what is the shortest segment that contains six other than six itself? And in order to find it, I just have to add this uh, largest power of two that divides six to six itself, right? And that gives me eight. So basically, if you look at the jumps that I'm doing here, I'm always jumping by, again, L of J or L of I in this case. So basically, if I want to add X to index I, I say that, well, F I has to increase by X, right? But then what is the next segment that contains index I? Uh, I have to just go there. So what is the next segment? It's just I plus L of I, okay? So I say something like this. I say, while I is less than or equal to N, uh, let's say that F of I increases by X, and then I go to the next index, which is just I plus L of I. Again, this is my add function, three lines of code. Okay. Great, so this really simplifies our life. We can now implement things really fast. What are our runtimes? Again, addition is going to be O log n because we're just going over all of the segments that contain index i, and there are O log n of those. Uh, another way to see this is that every time that I'm doing this, the length of my segment is increasing. So it can increase at most O log n times because it's also a power of two, right? And this one, we already talked about it. It takes O log n uh, because it just goes over the ones in the binary representation of J. So great, let's just code this. So I'm going to say this is fenvik.cpp. Now, I don't have any of those fancy things that I had for a segment tree anymore. I just have one array F. Okay. And let's say my max N is something. Okay, I'm going to read my number N and I'm assuming my indices are from one to N now because again, zero was kind of problematic. I don't like zero. Uh, so I'm just going to do a bunch of operations. So let's say I have a string O and I say, as long as you can read O, if O is add, just read two indices, read an index I and a value X and do add I X. Otherwise it's a sum, read I and J. And here, I just want to take the sum from 0 to j minus the sum from 0 to i minus 1 and write that. Okay, So sum j is just going to give me the sum from 0 to j. That's how I'm going to do this. OK. Let's do sum first. So I have a sum. It takes some index j. It's supposed to give me the sum from index 0 to index j. 
Now I say if j is zero, return zero, because remember, I don't save anything at index zero of my array. And otherwise, again, we do exactly this thing that we did here. So I say I'm starting at some index j. I'm first going to take the array that ends at index j. I'm going to take the sum of that array. So that's f of j. And then after I do that, I go back by L of J st um, steps, where L of J was the length of this array, basically. And when I go back by L of J steps, I end at J minus L of J. So I have to say plus sum of J minus L of J. Okay. You don't have to write this recursively. You can also write it with a while. I'm intentionally writing the sum and add in two different ways so that you see both of them. But you can write any of them like the other one. OK, now I want to do add. So I have some index i, and I have some value x. Again, you can write this one recursively as well. But I'm going to write this one with a while loop, as I did here. So I say while i is less than or equal to n, I just realized my n has to be global. Um, I could also do max n here, but it doesn't matter. OK, while i is less than or equal to n, f i increases by x, and then i itself increases by l of i, where l of i was the length of the array at index i. OK. So for example, again, here, if it's if my i is 3, I first uh, update the value here. Then I have to go forward by the length of this array. So I have to go to 4. So I update the value of this one. And then I have to go forward by the length of this array. So I have to go to 8, and so on. And you can see that this makes sense, because at every level, the length of the array is double. OK. Now. This, of course, works. Uh, sorry, this should be void. Uh, this works in all log n, but it works as long as I know the L values, right? the length of the arrays. So here's a normal way of doing it. And then I'll give you the competitive programming way of doing it. I can just have an array L, which saves these lengths and I can pre-compute the values in it, right? How can I pre-compute it? Well, I just, after reading n, I say do a pre-compute, and here's my pre-compute. So I just look at every power of two, and I go over all of its multiples, and I update their L value, okay? So I say for i from one, and i less than or equal to n, every time multiply i by 2 or shift i to left by 1, you can write whichever you want. Uh, I would just go over all multiples of i, and I update their L value. So for j from i to n, every time increasing j by i, I say L of j is i. And you can see that at the end, L of J becomes the biggest I such that uh, J was a half point. So if I do this, I have all of my L values. And now that I have my L values, my sum and addition work. OK. How much time does this pre-compute take? Any idea? Well, it's obviously O n log n, right? Because this first for loop has at most log n iterations, and this for loop has uh, at most n iterations, right? But it's actually O n, if you think about it, right? Because I'm going over all the numbers when i is 1. When i is 2, I'm going over only half of my numbers. When i is 4, I'm going only over 1 fourth of my numbers. So the total number of steps is n plus n over 2 plus n over 4, so on. So it's just at most 2n. It's all n. 
So this free computation doesn't matter that much because I mean, anyway, I was keeping the array F that has length N, so I had to spend O N time. And now I'm just doing this pre computation in O N as well and finding all the lengths for all of my indices. But in C, we have this thing called two's complement, which is the way that numbers are represented. So, especially if you have numbers that are, uh, yeah, so. Usually our numbers are 32 bits or 64 bits, but especially if you have numbers that are signed, in the binary representation, you just have zeros and ones, right? You don't have a negative sign. So you have to assign sequences of bits to actual values. Now, if your values are unsigned, if your values are non-negative, this is obvious. It's just a binary representation. If your values are signed, this is how it works. So we first put all of our uh, non-negative numbers. So we start from zero, then we add all of our positive numbers, one, two, and three. And then we add our negative numbers, but in the weird, uh, <laughs> well, this is also in sorted order, but yeah, first we add our positive numbers in sorted order, then we add our negative numbers in sorted order. So if I have a three bit integer and it's one zero zero, that actually corresponds to minus four. Okay. Uh, and this is like the table for eight bit integers. Of course we have 32 bit and 64 bit integers. Now, because of this magic, and this is something that I'm not going to prove to you. Here's what you can do. If you want to find L of J, you can just take j and end it with minus j. And it gives you L of j. Okay. Let's just do an example to see how this works. So for example, okay. let's take the number two in this three bit system because it's really hard for me to do it in a 32 bit system. So two is just zero, one, zero. What is minus two? Minus two is one, one, zero. Okay. The only bit that is common among both of them is the last one bit. So if you take the and, the and of these gives you zero, one, zero, which is exactly L of two. And the same thing for all of these uh, other things. Anyway, you can prove this. Honestly, it's a tedious proof. I don't want to do it. So this allows you not to use the L and makes the code a little bit shorter. But honestly, it doesn't really affect the runtime that much. So here, instead of L of J, I have to just write J and minus J. Again, the code looks funny, but it makes sense. I trust, uh, yeah, trust me on this. And then here, instead of L of I, I should just write I and minus I, and this works. So this is how you can do it without a segment tree with like six, seven lines of code. It would be shorter in Python because I wouldn't need this. But let's look at the, tree version of this again. So you could technically, if you wanted to just save the tree instead of just saving that one array F. Again, it's not a great idea, but you could have done that. And if you do that, then when you want to find the sum, you just start at the root of the tree. So again, let's say I want to find the sum to 11. I just start at the root of the tree and I process its children from right to left. And I ask, what is the first child that I can go to? So if I want the sum from zero to 11, I would just go to eight. And then again, I would process the children of eight from right to left. And the children of eight uh, from right to left, the first one I can take is 10. And then the children of 10 and so on until I get to my target, which in this case was 11. In my whole life, I have never implemented this as a tree with pointers. 
it's doable, but honestly, it's painful. And what's wrong with this? This is great, right? So just do this.